I used to be the uh, product manager of Sangrid Engine. And about last year, I, I had a contract for about one year with University of Chicago Fermilab uh, um, Open Science Grid. And I've had many conferences about this very powerful computer that you see here. Now, I'm going to ask you something here. How many of the people in this room has ever worked directly with a supercomputer? How many of you have a laptop? <laughs> what is easier to use, a laptop or a supercomputer? <laughs> so the question that comes now, how many scientists are in the world? So if you ask this question, and Timur the first time told me a million. So we started researching this, and we realized there are 12 million worldwide scientists, and 6 million are in the US only. And we have an actual report to substantiate everything here. And how many supercomputing users are? We saw here. I assume 100 users, direct user for each of the top 500 is 50,000. But you know what? I multiply that with another zero. Whatever I do, I realize that 95% of the scientists, not of the people in the street, they do not have access to a supercomputer. So in other words, they don't have access to all these fantastic tools that made us discover supernovas, Higgs. By the way, I read an interview. If you see the interview of Higgs, the Nobel Prize, they asked him, which part of mathematics you hate most? And he said, numerical analysis. That's why he left everybody else to do it, you know? Anyway, so, so I said, you know what? Um, they used to call Joe the scientist, the scientists who are not able to run this type of uh, cluster, uh, high cluster powerful analysis. So I did the research and I interviewed people from biostatistics, you know, all this list that you see here. And this, there are not really a Joe the scientist. Some of the guys were Nobel Prize grade, you know, very famous researchers. And some of the guys, they don't want to get into this business of, um, they want to be given, you will see right now, an interface and work with it. They don't want to mark with all the resources and everything else. So one guy said, in biology, he said, take number one. I can go how I did this survey. It was a conversation. It was face to face. You ask the guy everything, including what he likes in life and what he aspires and what he reads. He said, we are not interested to triple or so the number of hours, wall hours, by getting into different grids. But what we want is ease of use. How the hell I'm going to get to this resource? That's all I want. And then I asked him always, what if you have a magic wand? He said, if I have a magic wand, it would be nice to somebody generates all these scripts for me. They don't want to see scripts when you submit a job. And there were actually PhD, post-PhD graduate guys. They know how to use a computer. They don't want to muck with the system administration stuff of it. So this is what we had. And this is why I was nearly burned alive in front of the OSG all hands meeting when I showed them this data. We don't want to see any command lines. We do not care about infrastructure. They want to know it. We do not care about sysadmin. We want to see only familiar interfaces, which is galaxy in biology and the MATLAB. That's it. So as you know, I had the question, how do you manage resource analysis uh, in the speaker before? Of course, we have all these traditional system management uh, uh, software like Sangrid Engine, LSF, PBS. H.T. Conda, which is the same at University of Wisconsin for 30 years, Slurm, and so on. They are hard to use for 95% of the scientists. They are hard to monetize if you want to make a company out of it. And they are designed for campus institutional resources, not for the things on, you know, that we need here in real life. So now, one of the reasons Timur had the idea to make this 
There is a new tendency in administration of the resources. It's an explosion. I've never seen HPC in San Francisco. Have you seen HPC in San Francisco? They were all, I don't know where, in Department of Energy, <laughs> but not in San Francisco. All of a sudden, we are all in San Francisco here. And I think there is a couple of new web focus um, solution to eliminate the complexity from the toil of accessing simple resources. So this is this rescale, which is a hybrid SAS and PaaS. It's Pi cluster, which has been OK. They claim they failed, but they've been acquired by Dropbox, and I'll come to this later on. You probably didn't hear from this one, because Timur discovered and sent it to me. His cluster came, Palo Alto, a very smart guy, who decided to do an equivalent to SG inside Amazon. All it does is does specifically for the nodes of Amazon. It doesn't want to know about servers or anything. It's everything done in that. Exabyte I.O. that uh, Timur is going to talk about it later on. And there is another project where I worked, which is called Bosco R in Stealth Mode. Um, and I explained to you there are 2 million uh, R users right now. Growing exponent. R is the uh, open source statistical analysis tool that every single data analysis that appear in New York predicting you the future and so on and so on is nothing but statistical analysis done with R, which is very, very complicated. But the beauty of it is that now we have all this powerful computing to do it, we can do some results that we were not possible before. Still hard to monetize. And uh, at least we have this new company. And that's one of the reasons we are here. We want some of the next millionaire who are going to make headlines to come from this room. Not from Zuckerberg, Schmuckerberg, uh, Harvard, whoever it is. I'm sick and tired of this social network. They are making it. Let's go and do it, guys. This is it, you know. So why Pi Cloud join Dropbox? The guy said, well, you know what? The VCs come to us, he said, we want money, 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 money. And with us in this industry, we cannot compete with the social sites. We cannot. We cannot give you the money they got in. So they said, OK, we will accept an offer from Dropbox. Now, why Dropbox are hired? Pi Cloud. I want you to go to the website of these guys and then to go please to HT Condor website to see a disaster there. These guys are simple, are clear. Okay, so this is the explanation from Wired Magazine when they announced the whole thing, which you can read, of course. It's behind the scene. The world's most popular web services are turning into supercomputers that processing mass massive amount of information. And this company are La Crime, the La Crime, the social networking. They need the expertise of people who know how to build a more complex and powerful computing system. It's true. Uh, all these LinkedIn, they transform themselves in supercomputing engine, especially to process data and everything else. <coughs> so in my experience, the focus should be on the application, not on the infrastructure. Uh, for example, I see this scale. They have a page of LS Dyna, a page for this, a page for that. Then they ask the guy to make some decision about infrastructure. Wrong. I mean, who I am to say? No, nobody. They know better. They got the financing and they managed to do it. Great. But really, they divert the uh, attention of the user. Because the guys, guys who are coming to these sites to run in a special environment and application, they are interested on the application. On the LS Dyna and the R user are two different people. You won't find an R user running LS Dyna and vice versa. Or maybe they will, but a complete exception. <coughs> so Bosco is the project uh, worked in open source and hopefully one day will productize. And we have a user base of two million. It's enough with one application to get yourself <coughs> users. So the success keys, user experience. 
you know, <coughs> I took these guys. I went to the Stanford, to the Nir Eyal, which is a guy who is creating desire in people. There is another guy, Fox, for Professor Fox from Stanford, uh, who has a model called uh, <coughs> um, MAT, which means, uh, I think it means ability uh, and trigger, and the M, uh, I forgot what it stands for. But usually the people are prepared to put a bigger effort if they have a bigger reward. If they don't have a bigger reward, they will not do it. So we have to create and use the same pleasure in it. I mean, nobody feels pleasure going to Fermilab and trying to access one of their computers. It's a pain because they're just waiting for the moment when they can actually work in whatever research they do. We have to, to eliminate that and create the pleasure. <coughs> My experience, don't expose users to infrastructure detail. Don't humiliate them. Ah, you don't know that. You're not from HPC, you know? And you have to overcome this HPC superiority complex by simply hiding it away. And that's all. And this is my coordinates here. Uh, one thing I want to say before I go, I put these slides in my blog if you want to see them there. And is anybody <coughs> following uh, Masters of Sex on TV, uh, the show? Anybody? No? But you know about Master and Johnson, right? The, you know, my, my Master and Johnson, when he went to talk about studies of human sexuality to the University of Medicine, he was rejected. He was treated like, why are you crazy? 1950 something. Exactly the same I felt when I talk about uh, user experience in, <laughs> in uh, HPC. They said, but this is the thing, you know, we want to discover the Higgs particle and everything. This fine guy, this fine guy, but there is a moment where all the things that you have done here, they have time to go mainstream. In this moment, we have to think how to make it accessible to everybody. Even if they are scientists, <coughs> we overlook 95% of that. So my first intent has been a failure. And I'm here, but I'm absolutely determined to continue this effort because I feel more and more people are supporting me. Thank you, Nico. Right. Thank you. Thank you.